Uh, very good morning, everyone. Welcome yet again for uh, another master class. This is the fifth master class in this series. And in this master series, master classes, we are discussing the clinical case discussion on important clinical topics. So this is the fifth in the series. Last week, we discussed uh, uh, patients uh, uh, with uh, different disorder. Today, we discuss about uh, the patient who comes with recurrent jaundice. All of us know that a number of patients in outpatients uh, uh, do come to us with the symptoms of recurrent jaundice. And how do you approach? Recurrent jaundice we could be intrahepatic, extrahepatic, and there are a number of causes of that. Yeah. What, is, what is the ideal uh, clinical, uh, uh, clinical way uh, to, to approach these patients? And for that, uh, we have- Total environment. Total Ruben, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry. Uh, very good morning, everyone. Uh, very good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, the fifth master class of IHG. Uh, the second phase of master class, we are talking about a clinical case discussion uh, on various topics. Uh, this is the fifth in the series. Uh, today we will discuss about. Uh, a uh, patient with recurrent jaundice, how do you approach them and how do we reach to a diagnosis uh, in the most appropriate way? And to discuss this uh, uh, case, uh, we have a, a three very eminent uh, 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 faculty, uh, Dr. Anup Saraya. Anup Saraya is the professor of gastroenterology at, uh, uh, and head of gastroenterology at the uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, my alma mater. Uh, Dr. Setu Babu, Dr. Setu Babu is, is uh, at Kim's Hospital, uh, he's uh, one of the uh, very senior, uh, very senior gastroenterologists and very good teacher. Had a lot of interest in he teaching uh, the medical students. And we have Dr. Ajay Duseja, uh, who is a professor of uh, hepatology at uh, PGI Chandigarh. Yeah. We have a, uh, we have a Dr. Sunil Kandeja, uh, again uh, additional professor at uh, PGI Chandigarh. Uh, he will the facilitate the case. He will uh, run through the slides and, uh, and, uh, at, and uh, put forth questions. At the end of it, uh, summarize uh, uh, the approach to patient with recurrent jaundice. Along with that, uh, we have uh, uh, two participants and I'll request Dr. Ajay. Both participants are from PGI Chandigarh. Uh, may I request Dr. Ajay uh, to introduce to them? And I hand over this uh, proceedings to all the three faculty and Dr. Taneja and uh, uh, two of the uh, trainees in gastroenterology, hepatology. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Govinda. I think at the outset, uh, my sincere thanks uh, to ISG, especially Dr. Makaria for giving us this opportunity. Uh, so we will be, we have, what we have planned is that we have uh, um, planned two cases of recurrent jaundice. Uh, first case would be what we call the long case can go on for an hour or so. And the second case would be a short case and maybe for half an hour or so, since we have one and a half is in, uh, is in total with us. And the, for presenting these two cases, I think we have uh, two of our DM residents, DM hepatology residents from our department, uh, Dr. Uh, Akash Gandotra and Dr. Amandeep Singh. And so they would be alternating and presenting the, you know, the history exam investigations and all. So with the permission of uh, Dr. Saraya and Dr. Setu Babu, uh, can we request one of them to start the case? Yes, yes. Yeah. So uh, maybe Dr. Akash, you can start with the first case. And Dr. Taneja, can you please share the slides and uh, we can go ahead. Good morning, everyone. So for the first case, we have uh, Ms. R with 17-year-old female, resident of Sirmaur, Himachal Pradesh, and a 12th standard student. She presented to us with the chief complaints of recurrent jaundice for the past three years. So in the background history, uh, the first episode was in 2011, when uh, she developed yellowish discoloration of eyes, which was associated with high-colored urine. It was no noticed by her family members. There was no history of fever, nausea, vomiting at that time. There was no history of jaundice in the family or clustering of cases in a the locality. There was no history of pruritus or clay-colored stools. 
she was managed at a local center at the time of which no records are available she improved gradually and remained asymptomatic for the next one year she had a similar episode in 2013 which was again managed in the periphery of which no records are available and she improved gradually so this time she presented to us with the similar episode of jaundice associated with high colored urine for the last one month she had no history of fever pain abdomen distension black tidy stools hematemesis any history of complementary or alternative medicine intake or altered sensorium there was no history of ichymosis recent vaccination loss of appetite or weight there were no history of any joint pains myalgias or ulcers uh, dysarthria tremors any blood transfusions or any tattooing history or there was history of any high risk sexual behavior also so <clears throat> okay i think so this is a poll question so um, uh, maybe the admin can do that yeah okay i think we can stop here at 30 seconds so the question was that all are the causes of conjugated hyperbilirubinemia except so the 93% of the people have answered correctly which is uh, hemolytic jaundice so hemolysis will cause you know unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia whereas the other liver diseases would cause conjugated hyperbilirubinemia and from the history i think this uh, uh, lady uh, or young girl uh, kash what do you think she had conjugated hyperbilirubinemia or unconjugated the way she presented but based on history she had jaundice along with high colored urine right uh, so it's predominantly a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia okay so you will think more of conjugated hyperbilirubinemia can you have little high colored urine in some uh, uh, causes where it is predominantly unconjugated Yes, sir. We can have a high colored urine. For example, in Gilbert syndrome, some patients do complain of high colored urine, but that is more with fasting and uh, as the day improves or as they drink more of water, the urine clears. Right. Okay. So there could be a diurnal variation. So early morning, sometimes they do complain, but if it is remaining all throughout, it predominantly tells us it's a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So this girl seems to have a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So I think we can move ahead. uh the as i said 93% have answered it correctly so let's go further uh dr uh, setu babu dr um, saraya any question at this stage yeah, i just wanted to also explore the possibility of dual op options like somebody who has got hemolysis with an autoimmune just to think like a post gradually keep an option open sure yes so we can move ahead yeah So in the past history, she had no history of diabetes mellitus, tuberculosis, hypertension, asthma, or any surgery or chronic medication in the past. In the personal history, she attained menarche at the age of thirteen year, thirteen years, with regular cycles and normal flow. Uh, she consumes a mixed diet with two thousand kilocalories per day. there are no addictions uh, she has a satisfactory and academic performance in school and she belongs to upper middle class as per the modified kupu swami scale family history she is uh, uh, she is a child born to non consanguineous marriage with two siblings both are healthy there is no history of any similar illness in the family her father and mother are both healthy so to summarize my case she is a 17 year old female with recurrent episodes of non cholestatic jaundice with no prodromal symptoms for past 3 years with no history suggestive of liver decomposition okay i think um, maybe yeah we can have a poll question here from the audience and then we will ask akash to give what are his possibilities based on the history so the poll question is that the based on history which is the least likely diagnosis least likely out of the four choices aih chronic hep b wilsons and hemolytic anemia hello
Okay, I think we can stop it because 30 seconds gone. So again, 62% of people have voted for again hemolytic anemia, uh, which is the least likely, which I think majority have voted it correctly. But again, 30% have also voted in uh, for chronic Hep B, which they think is least likely. And 6% and 2% respectively have voted for Wilson's and autoimmune hepatitis. Dr. Saraya, Dr. Setu Babu, any thoughts on this? Uh, Dr. Setu Babu, you need to unmute yourself. Can you think of a primary sclerosing cholangitis uh, presentation, one, two episodes? Because that's more common than, for example, autoimmune hepatitis, Wilson's are less common, PSG could be slightly more common. I don't know your comment also on that. Yo, Akash, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, we'll go back. What are your thoughts? I mean, the question, can you answer this? Are you thinking of PSC here? Can you think of PSC? No, sir. I've not kept the possibility of PSC because, uh, first of all, uh, she is a female and uh, we see more patients of PSC in male patients. And, uh, uh, and sir, uh, recurrent episodes uh, with uh, spontaneous uh, resolution of jaundice would again no kakash that could happen but the only thing is it's a non cholestatic presentation yes no yes. PSC is a cause of your know, cholestatic jaundice so most of them would come with you know features of cholestasis here we are talking of a non cholestatic right so yes psc would always be a differential somebody coming with recurrent young Male commonly, yes, but male, young female also. But then you can keep that as a possibility, maybe low down because it's a non cholestatic, but you can't really exclude that based on the history. Yeah, Jay, can I make a small comment? Out yeah, there? sure, please come. Yeah, uh, Akas and all others that uh, gender based diagnosis in a single given patient may not be appropriate unless occurs exactly only in females or male. We are not talking of 100 patients. In the clinical uh, outpatient or inpatient, we talk of a single patient where uh, we do know that the PSC does occur in a lot of men patients. So therefore, ruling out just men being men or women may not always be right. So maybe probably we, we don't emphasize too much on the gender on these issues. It's yeah, defense, actually, it's a defense actually. Hmm. Yeah. It's uh, so can we, uh, Akash, now can we uh, request you to tell us your possibilities based on the uh, history? What are your possibilities based on the history? So based on the history... Uh, and um, Akash, sorry, you need to tell us the possibilities and maybe points in favor and against each possibility, right? Okay. Yes, sir. So based on the history, this looks like to be a hepatocellular uh, origin of jaundice predominantly non-cholestatic, so I would like to keep my first possibility as uh, autoimmune hepatitis. And uh, points in favor of autoimmune hepatitis would be a uh, young age with uh, a female, uh, female gender with multiple episodes of non-cholestatic jaundice with no uh, history of any prodromal uh, symptoms. So I would like to keep that as my first possibility. But uh, spontaneous resolution uh, without any treatment and... Uh, uh, sir, recurrent episodes every year uh, would would be a soft pointer against uh, autoimmune hepatitis. So let so, me stop you here. So how common is the acute presentation of autoimmune hepatitis? Because she has always presented like an acute hepatitic illness, you said, right? And it is number one. And secondly, how common is this recurrent acute presentation with AIH? Sir, around 25% of the patients of AIH presents as acute hepatitic illness. And uh, sir, for the second question, I could not find any data on uh, recurrent episodes of AIH. Uh, any patients or any case series or any case reports of... Okay. Dr. Setu Babu, please. Yeah. There is one more clinical spectrum which all of us should learn. In the first episode could be an acute viral hepatitis. That precipitates an autoimmune as another phenomenon which we need to know. For example, Hep E, the first presentation. Then subsequently, the autoimmune gets precipitated and it will present autoimmune. This is just to know the clinical spectrum. Real-time practice is slightly different from laptop-based presentation. But you should also know this entity clearly. I, Anakash, I hope Ajay. And Akash, what are the points which goes against the diagnosis of recurrent means uh, AIH at this stage? Sir, uh... Uh, a spontaneous resolution without any treatment and uh, so no other history of any other concomitant autoimmune diseases 
How so frequently is AI is present with jaundice? What is the commonest presentation of AI? So commonly, the patients will present with uh, transthaminitis, and they can have concomitant jaundice as well. Uh, usually, the acute hepatic illness they will present as acute hepatic illness with raised liver enzymes and uh, high bilirubin. So, I think fatigue no, no. and arthralgia. These are two important features. Present and fatigue yeah. and arthralgia. And fatigue and arthralgia is not there. It is jaundice. Right. And the Kash, you yourself said the acute presentation is only in 20-25 percent, right? So yeah. most of the patients will come as what we call the chronic hepatitis. Will they may not come with jaundice? It's only the symptoms like fatigue, arthralgia, yeah. and other symptoms. And then on investigations, they are found to have raised enzymes, positive autoimmune markers. So that's the commonest presentation. So this is not a very common, but yes, acute presentation can happen in around 20-25 percent. So what is? Uh, how about your second and third possibilities? Can you tell us the points in favor and against? Sir, I've kept uh, chronic hepatitis B. So okay, this was your uh, your discussion. Okay, fine. Uh, tell us. Sir, I've kept chronic hepatitis B with players as my uh, second possibility, and uh, uh, sir, the points uh, in favor of chronic hepatitis B would be uh, her young age. Uh, I'm presuming that she had a perinatal infection and now she has presented with uh, chronic hepatitis B with acute uh, hepatitic flares. And since we are in the uh, sir, uh, intermediate endemic zone, so that makes it more uh, likely. And uh, uh, But sir, uh, most of these patients, around uh, 30 to 40 percent of the patients uh, can present with uh, acute hepatitic-like illness uh, with the flares uh, with uh, more than five times of uh, ALT rise. But uh, usually these patients have uh, concomitant decompensations along with it, which was not present in the index case. So that would go against the uh, possibility of chronic hepatitis B, sir. So the, I think the question again would be, you know, how common are the spontaneous flares? Because she has had these spontaneous flares. I'm pretty sure she was not on any kind of drug which could, you know, induce a flare in her. So what that would be the first question. And the second question, which I mean, which you have already said yourself, how common when the flares happen, how common are the ectric flares in comparison to, you know, anectric flares? Sir, uh, around 30 to 40 percent patients presents with spontaneous uh, flares in chronic Hep B. And uh, uh, most of the time, these are anectric flares with uh, just the abrupt rise of ALT of more than five times. Uh, but ectric presentation can be there in around Sir, 5 to 15 percent patients. Okay, Dr. Setu Babu and Dr. Yeah. Saraya. Yeah, please. I, 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 for a minute, suppose I remove the cholestatic and patient is cholestatic. Could you add two or three causes? Just I want to know how many you know. For example, are you thinking of a PFIC type 3 or something like that? Could you think of if cholestasis were to be there? Sir, if cholestasis comes in the picture, so I would like to keep uh, PSC as one of the possibilities, then PFIC-3, yes, uh, PFIC-3 would be one of the possibilities, sir. Uh, Akash, uh, PFIC-3, will you keep if the cholestasis is there or break you will keep? Or break. Brick is the probably a better habit. Brick. PFIC, you know, by definition is a progressive disorder. So once somebody has a jaundice, they can get into liver failure progressive. Whereas brick can, you know, continue to happen recurrently. Brick is a better thing. Yes. Brick, brick would be a better possibility. Yes. Now the out of all the PFIC, you know, PFIC three can happen in adults, and we know PFIC one and two would happen in, you know, neonates or children. Yeah, right. Okay, fine. So can you go to the third possibility? Why did you keep Wilson as the possibility in this patient? Sir, so because of the young age. Uh... I have kept low down the possibility of Wilson's, although I could not find any uh, neurological symptoms uh, or uh, uh, answer a recurrent episode with spontaneous resolution that goes against the uh, possibility of Wilson's. But uh, low down the order, sir, I've kept Wilson's because of the young. See, well, what is the clinical setting when Wilson can come with, you know, recurrent jaundice? What, what, what causes this recurrent jaundice? You know, Wilson again can come as chronic hepatitis, acute hepatitis, cirrhosis, right? All that. So how, why, when do they come as recurrent jaundice? Sir, uh, sir uh, Wilson's disease has uh, uh, 
associated uh, hemolytic anemia so at that time they can present with recurrent jaundice so will they have uh, again i think we have discussed earlier conjugated hyperbilinemia versus unconjugated so will they present like you know and if she was hemolyzing you would have expected you know some other features of hemolysis features of anemia and the urine may not have been high colored right so it's yes. probably not the recurrent hemolysis which is happening so it is something else so still would you like to keep the possibility of wilsons sir on the basis of history i i i will still keep my possibility uh, but low down the order sir uh, dr setu babu dr saraya you did mention hemolysis what is your clinical evidence of hemolysis sir patient will have uh, no 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 here here you mentioned hemolysis we want to talk only about this case i i will not be impressed with your theory in the real time exam so what is your evidence of hemolysis to say that's very difficult when you, here you are thinking of uh, autoimmune with hemolysis or baseline something and then you are adding hemolysis or wilson's progressive this with what will be the clinical evidence of hemolysis in the absence of liver disease in the presence of liver disease for example somebody who has got recurrent jaundice with an almost near normal stool or sometimes high coca colored stool both can happen and cholestasis is uncommon in hemolysis and the eye color is altogether different and they'll have less of uh, conjunctival pigmentation so i think these things you need to look at uh, when you talk about clinical hemolysis make a note on clinical hemolysis with liver disease clinical hemolysis without liver disease so uh, i think that's okay uh, maybe we can also take some questions from the chat box here people are commenting are you considering gilbert syndrome here no sir there is a question in the chat box how do you respond to that sir gilbert usually presents with unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia and uh, uh, usually uh, sir that is that is not the case in uh, uh, that is not the presentation in our index case which predominantly this patient had uh, high colored urine that suggests conjugated hyperbilirubinemia so i have not kept gilbert as my possibility and again people are asking if you're thinking of a non cholestatic jaundice here should you then be talking about brick and pfic no that was a hypothetical yes. thing which dr setu babu had said we are not thinking of that right fine enough uh, again i think people are asking about how common are the chronic hepatitis b flares with clinical jaundice and recurrence so i think that's a very valid point which we have discussed i think that point is very well taken uh right okay so uh, let's go on to the examination i think maybe yeah yes 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 we yeah we can go to the yeah dr govin please yeah can you just discuss with them that uh, if recurrent jaundice is there then what are the four question or five questions you keep in mind and then based on that you make your differential like uh, conjugated and conjugated sure. or intra extra whatever uh, the clinical pointers yeah yeah absolutely i think uh, though we would be discussing all this approach maybe at the end also but it's very good to you know the first differentiation always would be whenever somebody comes with recurrent jaundice or for that matter even first episode of jaundice would be to be very very sure whether you are dealing with a conjugated hyperbilinemia based on your assessment or unconjugated we know that the bilirubinuria or the bilirubin gets excreted in the urine only when it is conjugated and we also know that the conjugated bilirubin will occur only in patients with liver disease or biliary disease so whenever somebody has conjugated hyperbilirubinemia or bilirubinuria or a high colored urine that puts you that either you are dealing with an intrahepatic disease or an extrahepatic disease uh, and it rules out you know or it excludes or keeps your possibility lower down towards you know prehepatic causes like we said for example hemolysis gilbert is also a prehepatic cause where there is a you know problem so i think th that would be you know they would become you know little lesser so i think with that uh, once you are sure this is hepatic or extra hepatic then you have to the second question you have to ask is is it a cholestatic jaundice or a non cholestatic jaundice so once you are if it is a cholestatic jaundice then there are points of differentiation between intrahepatic cholestasis and extra hepatic but if it is non cholestatic then i think you are focusing more on the liver like in this patient i think we are focusing more in the liver because it's a conjugated and it is non cholestatic so this is how i think we should be approaching and dr setu babu your comments on this i think we'll go ahead i think we'll go ahead okay fine so examination please 
ियोसिसफेक्टरी <laughs> coming to systemic examination uh, abdomen examination this uh, abdomen was scaphoid in shape symmetrical there were no dilated veins visible lumps or peristalsis umbilicus was inverted uh, uh, the liver was palpable 2 cm below the right costal margin in the mid clavicular line which was firm in consistency non tender with regular margin smooth surface with no bruit and liver span was 13 cm spleen was not palpable and there was no free fluid in the cvs uh, cvs examination respiratory examination and cns examination all was normal so i think again let me take out some questions from the chat box here people are asking about the kf ring did you mention yeah. that was it negative or was it seen or what no sir cataract signs of vitamin deficiencies skin ulcers how was the facies like uh, like thal face is what we call or thalassemic or something sir no features of vi vi chronic vitamin deficiencies uh, kf rings were not seen and right. uh, i i have a complaint against akash that he did not positively mention kf ring not seen sure that sure that upsets a very chronic examiner like me right be careful because that's actually the hero point of the case all the time we have been discuss and then uh, i would put three questions with permission of ajay how do you look yes. for kf how do you look for kf ring what do you mean by presence of kf ring what are the conditions where you can get false positive kf ring and does negative ring excludes wilson's disease uh, sir to answer your question kf rings are usually seen in the uh, upper eyelid and uh, it is because of the copper deposition in the desmens membrane and uh, we can uh, the uh, confirmatory evidence would come from this slit lamp slit lamp examination not and, eyelid uh, upper part of the cornea upper part not of eyelid. the superior lip, yes. limbus limbus yes limbus and uh, sir so 40% of the patients of uh, wilsons uh, will present with kf rings and the presence uh, the absent absence of kf rings would not exclude wilsons disease and uh, sir so, uh, uh, the other uh, uh, is seen in is also seen in sir yes the other clinical scenarios where kf rings would be present are sir uh, other polystatic uh, liver diseases like uh, sir psc or maybe chronic liver disease patients can also have kf rings sir good good okay so i think again uh, uh, akash before you can maybe after examination we can ask you that uh, what are your possibilities now are the same different or you want to add or subtract anything out of the possibilities which you said earlier Uh, sir after the examination i would still keep uh, the same possibilities as i've kept before the first one would be autoimmune hepatitis second would be chronic hep b uh, and third low down sir i am still keeping wilson's at the third possibility sir because you have not really got anything positive except for mild ictus and maybe just palpable liver people are still asking you about you know the scratch marks no scratch marks right so yeah. there was no history of any uh, itching there was no history of itching right okay itching. fine oh. right so again two questions people are asking is is a possibility of dubin johnson syndrome will you like to consider so dubin johnson uh, will present with conjugated hyperbilirubinemia but uh, so recurrent jaundice every year uh, so do dobin johnson comes with recurrent jaundice or persistent jaundice that is the question sir persistent jaundice usually they will have a persistent jaundice right i think so they will not be but yeah. i think if people are asking that is not totally uh, wrong because in dobin johnson also we can have recurrent jaundice we can have recurrent jaundice in dobin johnson along with conjugated hyperbilirubinemia right so that possibility should be kept lower right. we can and, yeah the more, most common is that most of these patients will have some jaundice but there is a possibility that there may be recurrent jaundice in dobin johnson also 
the other question which people are asking about how about uh, hepatitis a infection happening you know again and again in this the sir recurrent episodes of hepatitis a happening in these uh, same patient and without any clustering in the family or uh, uh, in the locality sir it's a little odd and uh, there was no prodromal symptoms uh, although they can be absent in a few patients but uh, since every year uh, the same illness happening in the uh, same patient without any clustering or similar episodes in the family sir i have not kept hepatitis a as the possibility sir okay and the other question which is again in the chat box is about you know when you were talking about the you were keeping aih as a first possibility and you said there was no autoimmune disease but did you specifically look for vitiligo again there's a question in the chat box yes sir i have examined the skin but you did not mention that i think that should have been mentioned right right okay and agar last question is about the bili was there a history of cam and could it be you know drug induced liver injury so there was no history of cam any drug could you be implicating here because i think uh, that's the question sir recurrent episodes uh, every year uh, there could be a possibility of drug induced liver injury but uh, specifically in the history there was no history of cam and take so i have not kept uh, delhi as the possibility sir okay again i think comments are about to look for the thyroid in particular alopecia in particular about the autoimmune okay so dr setu babu dr saraya any questions yeah yeah i think we sh we should ask what is the next now okay next would be then uh, maybe we can uh, uh, all uh, amandeep now aman can we ask you how do you investigate uh, this patient we can go to the investigations with these possibilities which akash have and then we can uh, Dr. Sunil can continue to show you the investigations. What do you want? How will you investigate this patient? So we can we go back to the slide, uh, uh, one slide picture? Yeah, take. Uh, sir, based on the history and examination, we have uh, enumerated some possibilities uh, right now. So the first possibility has autoimmune hepatitis. So I will go for some uh, routine investigation and some specific investigation for uh, the diagnosis. So first, I would like to see the routine investigation of this patient, like CBC. LFT, RFT, peripheral blood film, uh, you know RFT, electrolytes, and pyrogram to see the uh, status. Of... Okay, okay. So we can show you those investigations, and maybe you can analyze those investigations, or interpret, or give us your inference from that. So this is what you can see. Can you look at the investigations? Uh, yes, so we do yes. have LFTs and CBC in eleven and thirteen also, though the rest yes. of the worker was not done that time, as told by Akash. So can you look at all these and tell us your inference? Okay, sir. Uh, what I see, uh, patients' uh, complete blood count report from 2011 onwards uh, till 2014. What I see is that patients' HP is 11.7, 12, 11.4, 12.2. So, hemoglobin of the patient has been uh, fairly preserved, and uh, also platelet is 160, 230, 212, and 225. So it means that there is no anemia as such, and then platelets also normal, suggesting that there is no really uh, significant fibrosis. Coming to liver function tests, I see that in 2011 her uh, total bilirubin is 6.6 so with uh, conjugated uh, 3.6, uh, and which is also seen in uh, December 2013 and October. Both all these reports showing conjugated bilirubinemia. Uh, and enzymes uh, uh, AST, LT in 2011 and 2013 probably at that time she had this uh, flare of uh, hepatitis. The enzymes are more than 20 times. And we have a alkaline phosphatase report of 139 and 132. So alkaline phosphatase is not uh, very high in these two reports. And uh, however, in 2014, as AT, uh, his AST, LT are uh, slightly normalizing. Alkaline phosphatase is slightly on the higher side. And then coming to synthetic function, the patient albumin is 3.5, 4.8, and again 3.8. Uh, with an R of 1.5, 0.9, 0.9. So she had an acute severe. Uh, The autoimmune hepatitis in 2011, and but her synthetic function largely have been preserved actually. And uh, you know, Aman, I think we could see that, and you have uh, enumerated them well. But the question to you is, uh, Akash had kept three possibilities: AIH, chronic Hebe, Wilson's. Now, looking at these LFTs, uh, can you infer or interpret this that I mean, the enzymes are 20 times. at least we can see you know three reports 
and it's predominantly conjugated hyperbilirubinemia uh, near normal alk fos in two but then we have one report which the alk fos is elevated so how do you interpret and alt is more than ast that's another thing uh, yes sir uh, i can see that in 2011 to 2013 she had uh, very high enzymes more than 20 times with conjugated bilirubinemia and keeping in mind the history of this patient so I think these reports are consistent with uh, uh, autoimmune hepatitis and uh, because uh, in uh, again in Wilson disease we don't really tend to see so much high level of uh, enzymes going to the tune of 20 days and then resolving spontaneously by themselves and uh, also that in chronic hepatitis B the, it's more of an anecdotal type of presentation so I think based on these uh, investigations, uh, the possibility of autoimmune hepatitis remains uh, the first. Uh, okay. Before I think Dr. Setu Babu asks you some question, two questions are from the chat box. Do we know the peripheral smear and how about the gamma GT? Okay, uh, Aman, uh, I thought you would also be adding, this is only to add, reticount is missing in this. That's what we were discussing because even if you are autoimmune, the reticount would make some, you know, instead of saying everything normal. The second yeah. thing is given December 2011 alone, I don't think we can make a diagnosis of autoimmune and first. You could have probably said, given that particular first value, it still could be an acute hepatitis of any origin. You should be very, I, I want to know more from you rather than just getting biased by the history alone. It could be an acute episode. The second episode may be autoimmune. Yes, it's quite acute, possible. Uh, all these, uh, the first differential is acute hepatitic illness. That's right. And uh, no, you, so, you concluded it is, I, I have an objection. You suddenly concluded autoimmune with a bias. You go slow. I want to know more from you. Given first segment of report alone or first part of it, it still looks like a kind of an acute severe hepatitis. Look at the INR gone up a little bit. She could have actually slipped into an acute liver failure if she were not probably handled properly or anything. You agree with that, Ajay, sir? Yeah, absolutely. So I agree. I think so. This these LFTs just tell you that this is an acute hepatitis. All three, I mean, even 11, 13, it is not pointing towards any etiology. It could be all virus. Yes. I mean, and, and as we discuss, yeah, Dr. Sir, I have please. Yeah. And another thing, like globulin is not very high. So that's globulin is not high. Yes, yeah, so yeah. At this stage, we can at best say that patient is having hepatitis. Hepatitis, yeah, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And what is happening in October 14 and uh, December 14? Looks like she was improving here, right? Yes. Yes, okay, sir. Okay, okay. Uh, she's uh, like the October 14 and uh, bilirubin enzymes are settling and uh, then in December 2014, I think that's the time she presented was uh, the bilirubin was settling and enzymes okay. also. So again, people are asking about globulins, retic count, LDH, ESR, gamma GT and slit lamp. I think very important, you know, feedbacks we are getting from the audience. Thanks audience for that. I think so. How about your, you know, LDH, retic count, globulin, KF, I um, mean, slit lamp. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I think uh, since we have an acute hepatic illness uh, at this point of time, so I would like to see the evidence of uh, hemolysis and then slit lamp <clears throat> combination. So, but are you seriously considering hemolysis here? That is what we are asking. Conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, enzymes in thousands. And ALT more than AST, are you considering hemolysis? Yes or no? Uh, sir, as I already said, that uh, such a high level of enzymes are uh, more suggestive of acute hepatic illness and hemolysis are less likely possible. Yes, and yes. So, agree. Agree. There, so, so enzymes right. wouldn't be so high. So, Agreed. Uh, agree. Okay, fine. So what else do you want now? What further? <clears throat> uh, sir, uh, since acute hepatic illness is uh, differential here, so I would like to see her uh, viral markers. Okay, we'll show you the viral markers. So all viral markers A to E were negative. What else do you want now? Uh, okay, sir, if all the viral markers are negative, so I think the next uh, I would like to have uh, autoimmune markers in this. Autoimmune case. markers. So all autoimmune markers, again, ANA, ESMA, NTIK1, AMA and PCA, which we do as a panel in PGI, they were all negative. So what do you want now? So again, I think let's go, before we go further, I mean, is it again helping you whether this was a 
acute viral hepatitis which was happening and obviously this episode was also there versus autoimmune or it, it could still be both the possibilities could still be open could it be yeah okay you can respond and then we can can ask you some questions could it be uh, yes sir i think still uh, possibility remains open zero negative viral hepatitis versus autoimmune hepatitis so so both zero I... negative possibilities are still open right okay fine very well right so what do you want now uh sir uh, the autoimmune markers uh, the conventional ana sma lkm are negative also em and pc so if we can get extended panel uh, autoimmune markers what do you want in the extended panel and what do you want to look for that extended panel here yeah. uh, sir soluble liver antigen or uh, uh, liver cytosol 1 uh, maybe p and k and uh, if they are available then i would like to see them also so we had sla and i think uh, yeah lc1 and this they were also negative so what do you want now so in what percentage you know the question would be that you have a c negative hepatitis routine conventional autoimmune markers are negative so what percentage you will have these extended panel any of the marker positive how commonly does it really help you and these may not be available all over yeah uh, sir uh, zero negative uh, uh, autoimmune hepatitis can be seen to the tune of 25% and also in acute severe hepatitis also 25% of patient can be zero negative so even though uh, these conventional and extended panel autoimmune markers are negative so this does not really rule out the possibility of autoimmune hepatitis uh, at this stage so okay dr setu babu your thoughts here uh, <clears throat> you only need to know that there is a negative component in autoimmune hepatitis and uh, basing on that probably you know that the next algorithm goes into a more, more definitive investigation let them tell i don't want to okay fine so uh, dr saraya any questions at this stage no not okay we can go ahead so what do you want further raman hmm. uh sir so going further uh, i would like to see if total immunoglobulins of this patient Uh, okay IgG. so you would like to look at the igg okay we'll show you the igg was 18.5 can you tell the audience what is the normal value and is it elevated and if yes what what times you call it in ah you always say 1.1 1.2 times or whatever hmm. uh, uh sir igg total is high the uh, high cut off range is 16 gram per deciliter so it is more and i it is uh, more than 1.1 times so which means that it is significant uh, elevated so i think the total igg levels are uh, uh, high and uh, they kind of help me to uh, is it possible that somebody has elevated igg but this is not because of the autoimmune hepatitis or because of something else uh, yes sir uh, in uh, uh, high fibrotic uh, condition even in cirrhosis the total immunoglobulins can be high so okay. this is also a possibility also other conditions with hypergammaglobulin you may have patient can have high total igg level sure okay so anything else you okay let me look at the chat box igg total people have asked that you have already answered and people are asking would you like to repeat the autoimmune markers here because you know once negative not means that next time you may get it you know uh yes sir uh, it's a uh, it's a good idea to actually uh, uh repeat autoimmune markers uh but they can be sometimes uh, we negative in initial report and subsequently we might 10 to 5 25% can have a positive uh, uh, serology report in the subsequent death so that can be done so okay dr shetu babu please yeah uh, when when you were asking serial ones let's say it is positive before can the titers come down with treatment or titers change with treatment because this is something which we need to also say that yes sir uh, uh so, once we start the treatment uh, the biochemical remission the total igg levels they, they can tend to become normalized and uh, so that that can happen and honestly ajay would watch for me and uh, it is like you know if it is negative that coming positive is less likely but if it is positive the titers coming down or even becoming false negative or temporary negative because the titers are slow low your detectable test system all make it so negativity does not mean negativity positive could be false positive in our all practice guidelines 
Yeah, the only other thing sometimes what we observed is the kind of methodology you use to test Correct. these autoimmune markers. Correct. Whether it is immunofluorescence or it is ELISA, that also does make difference in your positivity. And people are also asking about, I mean, does the dilution help you in determining, you know, whether they are going to be positive or negative? I think dilution, my only perception would be dilution we would look into if you are getting a positive marker. But if it is negative, I think probably the dilution, I'm not sure. Uh, Dr. Setu Babu? Yeah, actually, there is one more method called CLIA method. That is chemical yeah. Right, these, right. These are all quite, as, as I said, negativity doesn't mean anything. But positivity, if it is positive in this circumstance, the severity doesn't matter to us. In fact, we take the threshold to start on therapy basing on that single positive result. That's what I feel. Is. Okay. So what do you want, uh, Aman, now after this? Uh, sir, uh, I think uh, I like to see ultrasound abdomen of this patient now. Uh, why do you want ultrasound? Yeah, why do you want ultrasound? And people are asking about again KF ring and ceruloplasmin. Do you want that? Uh, even though, sir, uh, we have uh, a fairly uh, uh, felt feel that the possibility of Wilson disease is very unlikely in this patient. But however, I think uh, it's always a good idea to. Uh, uh, fully rule it out. So I would like to see KF rings and zero. You know, everything costs, uh, you know, to doing as, this thing. So if you had a possibility of Wilson, so, and uh, as I said, as we discussed, somebody coming in thousands, you know, the enzymes are in thousands, recurrent episodes, even the clinical picture was not fitting into, you know, Wilson. The LFTs were not fitting into that. There was no evidence of hemolysis. Yes, I think it was done in this, which was normal, but then, yeah, Dr. Setu Babu, yeah, please. I want to give you one test to save the cost effectiveness for Wilson's. Which one you prefer? I'll give you one test. Don't mind cost. You have five panel tests, including, say, 24 hours or deep pencil challenge, whichever you want. Just tell me which one is that. I just want to know how do much you know about this Wilson's, which test is sensitive, which test is specific. Sorry for the question, Ajay. No, no, that's absolutely right. Yeah. So what do you want, Aman, for Wilson? One test, if you are asked. Or you grade the test. I don't mind. You First is uh, second, third, fourth, fifth. Mm. You know, copper level, ceruloplasmin level, and then urinary uh, copper uh, level. I think 24-hour urine copper level, I would... Uh, With or without challenge. Uh, there is one more added nuisance is challenge. Deep and challenge is there. So I want you, no, no, I expect you to know all these things, whether that fits into the case or not. I want to know how much you know, rather than you are prepared for this particular case. But I want to test you a wider approach. Like I said, you could have probably said, I wouldn't do Wilson's, but if I'm asked to do Wilson's, I would prefer out of the five available tests, this one I prefer. Like 24 hours urine copper is quite sensitive. But if you add deep end challenge, it is much more sensitive. Uh, I hope you agree with this, Ajay. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely fine. But the only thing I was uh, just thinking about is, can you have Wilson or what clinical situation can you have Wilson with normal ceruloplasmin? I agree. This is, again, another very important, which we know very well yeah. it can happen. Yeah. Yeah. Almost, I, I believe if I'm wrong, 10 to 20% of the Wilsons do have almost, uh, you know, normal ceruloplasmin. And, they don't yeah, and especially if it is going up because of yes. the acute phase reactant. Yeah, yeah. So, Okay, so Aman, with this now, what do you want now further? Uh, sir, I, I would like to see the ultrasound of this patient. Okay, okay. So ultrasound uh, was largely normal. Uh, I mean, it was a normal size lever, normal ecopectin, no IHBRD, spleen normal, and the portal venous system normal, GB normal. So what do you want now? So ultrasound is... Uh, 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 normal, sir, and including portal vein and hepatic veins are also normal. And so I would like to see uh, uh, fibro scan of the patient. I would like to see how much. Uh, why, why do you want a fibro scan here? Why do you want? Mm -hmm. uh, sir, patients are having recurrent episodes of uh, you know acute hepatitis and still having high enzymes, 85 and 68. So I might want to know how much uh, is there any fibrosis uh, present in the. Okay, Dr. Setu Babu, yeah. Uh, I think uh, the fibroscan would come after a definitive diagnosis because here, whether there is a fibrosis or not, it won't add to your diagnosis. Does it add to your diagnosis or eliminate a diagnosis? 
Webriskan is an interesting investigation. I know when you are talking, your priority of non-invasive approach, you are talking as a helpful tool, and it is readily available. But whether it Webriskan eight, twelve, or fifteen did not add to your diagnosis. And the other question, which is again there on the chat box, is: Is it the right time to do Webriskan? Because uh, you know, the or are you likely to get a falsely elevated value here? What were the liver enzymes? Last liver enzymes, two thousand fourteen. When she came, Billy Billy Rubin was one point seven eight, and ASTLT was eighty five and seventy odd. Okay, so I think uh, so. When you are likely to get an abnormal, I mean, falsely abnormal fibro scan based on the liver enzymes, if they are more than, if they are more than twenty times the acute hepatic presentation, then definitely if they are more than ten times, and sometimes even more than five times, but less than five times should not make major difference here, right? so yes i think we can look at this but as rightly put by dr setu babu this will not help you in making the diagnosis this will help you making maybe the staging the severity of the disease but not in making the diagnosis so the lsm was 4.9 and the cap was 222 uh, your thoughts on this or comments on this uh, so sir liver stiffness is 4.9 so i think that's normal so uh, i think uh, after this uh, we can uh, have a uh, So that uh, liver biopsy, I would like. No, so again, questions in the chat box are about anti-HBC total, anti-HBS, HCV RNA. Would you like to do these? Uh, sir, uh, uh, as we already discussed, that we uh, the possibility of uh, CHB flare is slightly less because of uh, you know more of an anectal hepatitis kind of presentation is seen in the hepatitis B. And no evidence of decomposition, no evidence of fibrosis in this patient. So I think the possibility of chronic hepatitis B flare is slightly less in this at uh, this stage of this patient. So I can go for a liver biopsy in this patient. Okay, Dr. Setu Babu, uh, and Dr. Saraya, please. Yeah. You you want a standard liver biopsy or you know guided liver biopsy? I think, sir. Uh, uh, We can go for a guided uh, liver biopsy uh, in this patient. Uh, you exclude uh, portal hypertension in this patient, is it? Yes, sir. We I think the uh, you, you you know it. The fancy question is: Would you like to do an endoscopy? Uh, sir, platelets of the patient are normal, and LSM is also normal, so there is no real indication for screening uh, pre endoscopy in this patient. Okay, say that. Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah. Keep, keep, keep I think we agree. agree. and again somebody had a question about that if you want to assess fibrosis and centers especially those who don't have fibro scan how about fib4 in this clinical situation yeah that's a good question uh, yes sir uh, fib4 again a non invasive uh, marker uh, for uh, fibrosis it can be done in patient over uh, i think the utility is, is not so high in uh, presence of autoimmune hepatitis So, so most of the data on fib4 is available in which uh, liver disease uh, sir chronic hepatitis c is uh, absolutely so chronic hep c or maybe with the nefold also fatty liver you have nefold liver. yeah yeah okay again the question is about the celiac serology here would you like to do a celiac serology would it be celiac disease presenting like this um so again uh, uh, if we go back to the history of this patient so yeah. so uh, there were no real uh, history suggestive of diarrhea indigestion and growth uh, anemia was not there and there is no evidence of uh, growth retardation so there was no real symptoms even though sld mentioned the uh, celiac serology uh, as a uh, work up in uh, evaluation of autoimmune hepatitis but the possibility and uh, is very less in this our patient so i think uh, we can uh, avoid that as a mistake yeah amran uh, yeah, and Aman and Akash, um, when you are in the examination mode, most of the examiners wants you to know how much you know. You, if you restrict to only this case, I am not sure whether you know something more or not. For example, the behavior of adult celiac is much different from pediatric celiac. I think you you probably need to look at those areas and learn more about that. Keep your notes ready. and give us more inputs you are only answering that particular question not going slightly out of the thing then i'll enjoy yeah he knows more you are only answering very restricted tubular answers 
So and you can explain. Yeah. The two more things in the chat box. Somebody has written no signs of malabsorption, normal albumin, normal HB. Would you still go ahead with celiac serology? And the other question people are asking, how about doing an MRCP? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, yeah, even though uh, there is no evidence of polystasis in this patient, but uh, going for a cross cross sectional imaging before going for an invasive investigation is, uh, uh, I think, a good idea. And uh, maybe we can consider that doing MRCP in this patient. But is what? it a stronger indication or a relative indication? It's a, it's a relative, relative. Uh, so mention that it's a relative, relative indication, indication. Just because it's a, not a good idea, actually. Because okay, I think the, yeah, good idea. But so the uh, another question, which I think before we go on to the next is, uh, you have asked for liver biopsy. So what are your expectations for liver biopsy? Do you think that the biopsy is going to make a diagnosis here? And will it help you in the management in this particular patient? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, liver biopsy uh, is an important component of uh, uh, all the scoring system that has been designed for autoimmune hepatitis can help us for the diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis and then also rule out uh, other uh, causes also. And then subsequently, uh, you know, if we establish the diagnosis, then we can also, you know, monitor this patient and uh, after treatment, look for any histological remission. So in typically in uh, autoimmune hepatitis, we have a characteristic findings which can help us to you know, establish the diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis. Okay, I think Dr. Govind wants to say something. I think probably we are getting short of time. And uh, Dr. Setu Babu, please. Uh, not until short of time. I just wanted a couple of questions uh, on celiac yeah. serology. Yeah, so sure. Celiac and liver is, is still evolving, and we, don't, we do not know everything about uh, celiac and liver involvement. But there are patients where there's a predominant liver involvement without any evidence of clinical malabsorption, even with normal hemoglobin. So therefore, uh, doing celiac at this stage, once we're discussing a young child, a, a young person with recurrent jaundice, is worth doing it. At best, it may be negative. But if it's positive, then you get the prize. Prize of uh, treating a patient Thank and you. killing the patient uh, uh, to a large extent. Right? Absolutely. So, uh, doing this test may not be a bad idea. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, Dr. Setu Babu? Yeah, I think you, you should you go ahead. Okay, okay. okay. I think probably we didn't have the celiac serology done in this patient. And I think the MR was also not done. So we went ahead and did a liver biopsy in this patient. So maybe we can show you the liver biopsy findings here. Yeah. Uh, Aman, can you stop here for a minute? We'll take the poll question. Poll question. Okay. Good stuff. Okay. So the audience uh, is at um, poll time now. Okay. So I can read the question for you. Which of the following is the most characteristic finding in AIH? And peripolysis, interface hepatitis, hepatic rosetting, and central perivenolitis. So, is the poll evident to the uh, audience? Yes, it. No, it. This will not be seen to audience. This will seem only to us. No. We can read, read out. Okay. The code no, code I can't out. see the results also, you know, which was coming earlier. Yogita? Yogita, we can't see the results which were coming earlier on the screen. Uh, Sunil, can you see that? The yes, I, I, I 70, uh, the answers were done by 77% of the people. Right. And the interface hepatitis was answered by 56%. Empiripolysis was answered by 32%, rosetting by 10%, and central perivenulitis by 3%. But the point very interesting is 77% of the people answered, and the 56% goes to the most important character, interface hepatitis. Aman, can you describe what is this interface hepatitis? You're not good pathologists, but some of the areas we know here and there definitions. Uh, sir, interface hepatitis uh, refers to a condition in which there is a portal inflammation, and this portal inflammation tends to spill over uh, into that uh, the uh, interface between the hepatocytes and the portal tract. So, uh, so this is uh, uh, 
associated destruction of the hepatocytes so doctor uh, that is we call atrophic septicemia yes. there is also one more thing is, that means we are leading towards fibrosis yes sir i think before we go on to the biopsy finding i think very important question which we probably did not discuss while we were discussing the liver functions and people spoke about mrcp uh, aman can you tell me she also had you know the last two lfts had shown that she also had elevated alkaline phosphatases so if you were thinking of aih were you also considering a possibility of overlap if he has overlap with what pac or pbc uh alkaline phosphatases at uh, this young age of 17 years uh, so overlap syndrome uh, will likely be psc in this patient that is known as autoimmune sclerosis you think that alkaline phosphatases was important and 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 if that was the case and if you think psc was a uh, consideration i think then the mrcp becomes you know all the more important right Uh, but then is it possible that her alkaline phosphatases was not because of liver disease and it was just because of her growing age yes uh, yes uh, about uh, up to three times uh, alkaline phosphatases uh, uh, upper limit of normal can be seen in patients uh, yeah so i think it could be related to that but yes i think the points are very well taken we must look at overlap in a setting where you have both alt and the alkaline phosphatases elevated and mrcp should be done before you go ahead with the liver biopsy i think points are very well taken i think uh, should be done okay yes dr dubapriya is there anything that really points out your diagnosis in the four histological qualities that we mentioned anyone which goes close to your diagnosis you are close to autoimmune and sir presence of interface hepatitis with lymphoplasmocytic uh, infiltration uh, is a uh, kind of more typically related to autoimmune hepatitis however no single uh, entity of uh, histological manifestation can uh, establish a, a diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis uh, completely so yeah i think so okay. all four can be seen yeah all can be seen and aman again the question i uh, important would be you know what is interface hepatitis was previously called as piecemeal necrosis you know this is just the spillage of inflammatory cells beyond what we call the limiting plate right so there's a limiting plate at the portal tract so this is i personally feel this can be seen in any chronic hepatitis it could be seen even in chronic hepatitis so what is so characteristic about this interface hepatitis would be the type of infiltrate one is that it has to be a dense infiltrate and second it has to be lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate right so i think interface hepatitis per se would not be characteristic and this is my personal maybe dr sunil can also chip in here and dr setu babu or dr saraya so i completely agree that it's the inflammatory infiltrate which is more important right and right if there is presence of imperopolosis i think that is also a characteristic right right okay dr saraya dr setu babu yes yes i fully agree with sunil and i think there are few more tests which should be done before starting therapy yeah sure because so, uh, once you are considering a possibility of autoimmune hepatitis i think and you want to put this patient on therapy certain investigations which are needed you have to rule out occult viral infection number 2 hiv infection and osteoporosis or osteomalacia Absolutely. these things one should always keep in mind and one should investigate before starting therapy absolutely i the right that if yeah. she were to be zero positive this histology could have confirmed that she is uh, ah the problem comes with zero negativity you should be doubly sure that you are not missing anything else just a caution yeah sure okay so can we show the uh, uh, biopsy findings here yeah uh, so aman can you just read this biopsy uh, slides uh, yes sir uh, uh, i can see a portal tract uh, at uh, this mandi uh, can you can you put your cursor if you can can you put your cursor and show us the uh, you know so so this is actually uh, okay the control is not with you okay maybe dr sunil can do that yes sir uh, sir this is uh, where uh, it's a limiting plate and we can see the spillage of inflammatory cells into the uh, hepatocytes so uh, suggesting yeah. interface hepatitis and also this portal tract which sir is showing also having a you no know, mild to moderate moderate mild to moderate uh, inflammatory cells in this portal tract so can we go I further can... next slide please yeah, yeah. what is this showing yeah sir this is uh, again uh, 
clear diagram which showing this uh, spillage of inflammatory cells into the hepatocytes. So interface hepatitis in both these portal tracts uh, suggestive of interface hepatitis. But can we go further? So can you identify the type of cells and tell the audience how do you identify these cells? That's uh, a lymphoplasmocytic infiltration. So the cells with uh, uh, you know eccentric place people like this particular cell. So this is uh, a plasma cell and the cells with uh, you know central epitoneplay are lymphocytic cells. So, so more of a lymphoplasmocytic uh, infil uh, infiltration uh, and along with interface apparatus, so quite sensitive for the possibility that we have kept. So, yeah. so what this is this uh, stain and what is this being shown here? So, sir, this is a mesen trichome stain uh, film and uh, we see there is a portal fibrosis is also there. So again, it's only involving portal uh, track. So it's a mild fibrosis is there, sir. Okay. So based on this, again, what would be your, you know, uh, uh, final diagnosis? Both uh, of you, I think, and maybe tell us your final diagnosis, and then we discuss maybe five minutes on the treatment here. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, keeping in mind the age of the patient, the history of the patient, and uh, the investigations that we have done in presence of high IgG and uh, negative viral markers and a uh, biopsy which is suggestive of uh, uh, you know autoimmune features so i think we can uh, make a diagnosis of uh, uh, syndromic diagnosis of recurrent uh, hepatitis probably autoimmune hepatitis in this patient so the questions again in the chat box are two very important question how do you know this was a liver tissue number one and secondly uh, can you tell i mean two third uh, only aih plasmocytosis would be seen only in two third and the plasma cell infiltrate can be seen in other causes of chronic hepatitis also. So what is so peculiar about autoimmune hepatitis here? Uh, sir, uh, the presence of uh, uh, this portal uh, infiltrate with lymphoplasmocytic infiltration and interface hepatitis, sir, this is a uh, quite characteristic uh, uh, of autoimmune hepatitis. Uh, really not uh, other conditions are associated with lymphoplasmocytic infiltrates uh, in presence of portal tract and uh, this uh, interface hepatitis. Uh, Dr. Setu Babu, Dr. Do, do, do you need a hepatitis B staining for this? You know, we used, we were used to taught. Uh, Ajay is actually very junior to me, but the, the word shikata staining is supposed to be said. We, we, we had, at least in my exam, the question, how do you stain hepatitis B? How does it look? You know, the red spots, beautiful spots on Chicago stain, the RC staining. I think you, you need to know a bit of it, now, not really in the modern exam, but uh, when you talk about histology, you need to have, what are all the possible stains to identify? And here also, I'll just give a tip that suppose there is an amyloidosis of the liver, what stain you are going to use. Just keep an idea, keep a note on this. Just don't restrict yourself to this case. What stains will give what finding and what histology would give what finding, low level, high level, ultra high level, what will be the finding? I think two, two three more questions, which are again very important. One is about the hepatitis B staining, copper staining, right? And lastly, I think again, uh, the people are asking, would you now like to do the uh, uh, revised, you know, AIH, international AIH scoring or a simplified scoring? Now you have a biopsy with also to give her a final or this is good enough? I mean, is, is scoring really important or you can just make a diagnosis? Uh, sir, in presence of this seronegative uh, hepatitis, I think the revised scoring system uh, is better uh, for making the diagnosis of uh, uh, what I mean, hepatitis. So I think we will stick to uh, device scoring system in this patient. Okay, maybe I'll request Dr. Sunil to tell us maybe yeah, a little bit of scoring here. I, I, do we have a poll question? So we have a poll question. Before. Okay, we have a poll question. Okay, poll question for the audience, right? Okay. So which of the following is not uh, included in the simplified AH scoring criteria? IgG more than 1.5 times absent viral markers, characteristic biopsic findings, and ANA more than 1 is 240. 
somehow the poll is not appearing on my screen, but maybe somebody else can. Dr. Sethu Babu, if yeah, you can see the answer. Actually, the uh, response rate is close to 100% people who answered. Serum IgG more than 1.5 times is answered by 50%. Absent viral markers, 10%. Characteristic biopsy findings, uh, 16%, and ANA 1 east to 40, 24%. I think the sensitive point everybody was mentioning is about IgG, more than 1.5 times. Here we have a funny thing. It is totally not 1.5. We have a very, very difficult situation there. And uh, Aman seems to have uh, you know caught by the IgG levels, which was marked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so can we uh, go further, Sunil? Can you tell us the uh, uh, criteria here and uh, yeah, the simplified so criteria? This is, this is the simplified scoring system which was uh, uh, published in hepatology in 2008. And uh, I think this is the score which is being used more commonly by all the physicians now and applicable more mm -hmm. in a zero positive state. Can you put a video on? So it can it is being used in places where the autoimmune markers are positive. And it to take antibodies, IgG levels, liver histology, and the absence of viral hepatitis. A score of more than seven is a definite AIH, and a score of more than six is considered as probable AIH. So what would be the score in our patient? Can we just score it? So two plus two four. It will be probable. It will be six. It's probable. Be, yeah, six, sir. Six, okay, because we had absent uh, autoimmune markers. Yeah, yes, yeah. Okay. 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 And uh, since we know that the final diagnosis is zero negative autoimmune hepatitis, as Amman has already said that the revised score is more applicable here. And in this, this obviously is a cumbersome score. And at times you will not have the HLA and you will not have other markers. Sometimes the history of drugs and alcohol might not be there, but this is a good score. And if you can calculate the complete score, probable is if the score is between 10 to 15 and definitive diagnosis if it is more than 15. And this has a pre-treatment score as well as a post-treatment score. Important is again, if you look at the histological features, this has really importance in this. The histology is important for this score as well. So what would be the revised score in this girl? Uh, so whatever parameters we had, the score was coming out to be 14 and it is uh, kind of- So it is still be probable. Okay, 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 okay. finally. So I think, uh, so uh, it is probable, Aman, so would you like to treat her as AIH or how would you like to treat her or what will you do now? I think let's go on to the final leg of our discussion in this, yeah. So can we take the poll question, sir, before? Okay, we take a poll question. Yes. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So all of the following are the first line drugs for AIH except prednisolone, azathioprine, prednisolone plus azathioprine and tacrolimus. Okay, go ahead. Acrolimus got uh, almost uh, 93, 94%. All right. I think everybody agrees with TAC as the... Truck yeah, truck. it's not the first line. That's fine. Okay. That's, I think, on the... Okay. So, Aman, how will you like, how will you like to treat her? So, I think uh, after uh, going through this investigation and hist uh, history examination of this patient, so I think we can start this... Uh, patient on immunosuppressive therapy at this stage. As uh, Seth has told that before uh, we actually switched to uh, this uh, immunosuppressive therapy, we'd like to rule out uh, any anti-HPC and then DEXA and all uh, metabolic markers. And then once we have started the treatment, we'll start that on uh, prednisone and dose of 0 0.5 to 1 milligram per kg dose. And then we can add, uh, after one to two weeks later, we can add uh, azathioprine in this patient. Uh, and this uh, this helps us to you know kind of uh, evaluate the patient whether it's responsive or not. We can get TPMT uh, activity of this patient, and then we can also avoid uh, azathioprine induced hepatitis in this patient. So we will then switch azathioprine and prednisone, and then uh, we'll look for a, a you know treat this patient on this uh, regime, and then slowly taper off this medication with five milligram per kg every two to three weeks till we uh, try to maintain the biochemical remission of this patient and then gradually we draw steroids uh, in this patient and uh, then we can actually uh, maybe switch to steroid free treatment. Also. Fine, fine. I think Aman, because the idea of doing this case discussion was to mainly tell you about the approach towards a recurrent jaundice rather than discussing the AIH in totality. 
So maybe I think let's not get into the more details here. Uh, and again, maybe take one or two questions here. And if um, Dr. Govind permits, I think we can go on to the second case because the two questions in the chat box are about that TPMT. Should you really be doing and it is really advocated before putting somebody on azathioprine? Number one, and the second question people are asking about the butsonide versus prednisolone in a non-serotic setting. So she's a non-serotic, right? So butsonide versus this thing. And then maybe, maybe can I ask Dr. Govind, can we go ahead with the second case or uh, continue with this? We can even continue in this or we can have a set, another case. We can have another case. Yes. Uh, oh, sure, sure. So some comments from the Dr. Setu Babu and uh, Dr. Saraya and then uh, Aman, your response to these two questions from the chat box. I will not question, but I will only leave some questions for reading. That is, what happens if you get a flare while on therapy? Second thing is, what is the role of a follow-up biopsy? This case is clinically not very active case. And you may get some steroid-induced well-being, but then you need to have certain guidelines about flare and follow-up biopsy. You, you will read that. Don't answer. Okay, fine. Yeah. yeah. So, Dr. Saraya, any quick uh, 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 comment? In fact, we can go for next case. Next case. And the only thing I would like to tell about this patient was that we were, again, this was a probable diagnosis. She was put on treatment. She was from a remote area of Himachal. And after two years, she kind of defaulted. So, she left treatment and she came back to us with flair. So now if you apply the revised criteria, which is actually post-treatment also, she came with a relapse. So that, you know, was kind of, you know, confirmatory with us. And we again started our immunosuppression and she again responded. So I thought it was, even though it was fitting into a probable, but that kind of default and her relapse and then again response, you know, helped us in kind of making it a definite diagnosis. So any thoughts on that? Otherwise, we can move on to the next. So that's a good clinical event follow-up. Yeah. yeah. We didn't want it to be defaulted, but then she defaulted and, uh, you know, that this, Actually, this will happen. Only thing is very quick, your comment on flare-up while on therapy is another big subject by itself. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, Dr. Wen, we can go to the next case. Uh, yes. uh, Neil, do we have any poll here? No. No, sir. So just to show you these guidelines and uh, ASA and prednisolone remains the standard of care and in ASLD now they, they have included bidusonide as a first line therapy also. So I'm not going into details of the treatment. Steroid, ASA and bidusonide are the treatment modalities which can be used. Right. So I think that was a question about bidusonide. Okay, let's go on to the second case then. This and maybe Dr. Yeah, Dr. Women, yeah, please. I have a question. This is just not a question, but an observation that this young girl, nine years of disease, 11, 2011, 2021. So would she have gone to cirrhosis by now? No. She's on our follow-up. Rather, I saw her only a month back and she's still doing well. We did her fibro scan done and it's a non-serotic liver still. So autoimmune do really do well, I think, uh, even, yeah, yeah. I think this is a place where fibro scan might be more useful. Yes, yes. We did that fibro scan now is. and she, that's still a non-serotic. Okay, so let's go on to the second case. Uh, um, uh, Aman, can you present the second case now? And be very short on this. We maybe just have uh, 20 minutes to you know discuss the second case. So you can just be very precise and short. Hmm. Okay, sir. This is our patient, 20 years old male, resident of Pune, Himachal Pradesh, and he's a student. So again, his uh, chief complaints were a recurrent jaundice uh, since one year. So coming to background history, the first episode was in September 2019 when patient has jaundice with high colored urine and was associated with itching which was progressive, more in palms and soles and it used to interfere with sleep, associated with clay stools and fatigue. Patient was admitted for 21 days at a local hospital and he improved symptomatically. The second episode happened in October 2020 and uh, it was a similar illness with uh, cholestatic jaundice associated with uh, clay colored stools and pruritus. Uh, now, patient came to us with cholesterol jaundice in three months when there was no history of any pain, abdominal fever, vomiting, abdominal distension, hematemesis, melina, bleeding manifestation, or drop in sensorium. In past history, there is no history of any diabetes, ischemic heart disease, tuberculosis, bronchial asthma, thyroid disorder, or any surgical intervention, and no history of any blood transfusion. Patient consumes mixed diet and there was loss of appetite by 50% and loss of weight of 2 kg in one month. Non-smoker, non-alcoholic, no addiction, no high-risk sexual behavior and no tattooing. 
a satisfactory social and academic performance in school. And family history, there was no family history of jaundice or arthritis, no history of any consanguinity. Uh, patient had one sibling, and uh, both uh, his sibling and uh, parents are healthy. So we can take the poll question here. Sir. Okay, I think let's go ahead with the poll. Which of the following is a likely uh, cause of jaundice in this patient? PSC overlap, Wilson's or Brick? Uh, so Shetu Babu, if you can, it's, yeah, it's, not, it's, not, it's not settling, it's moving okay. fast. Uh, because we need at least 80% of the people to, yeah. Okay. The, okay. Now, the PSC is 14%, uh, overlap syndrome 9%, Wilson's 50%, Brick 27%. Uh, probably statistically, Wilson's comes up. Uh, maybe people are all attracted by Wilson's and. <laughs> Okay, so Aman, how do you, uh, you know, analyze this uh, story or this history of again a young boy, you know, who's come to you this time, there are definite cholestatic symptoms. And he had one episode of cholestasis earlier. And did he kind of normalize in between you said? Uh, yes, sir. There's a history of uh, documented uh, normalization of... Uh, Normalize. And then he had the second episode when he has come to us and the second episode is going on, right? So what is your analysis? Uh, sir, again, a young male uh, with uh, cholesterol uh, jaundice. Uh, I think before you, before you answer, I think I was just little, you go back. The question is, why are people choosing Wilson's with a cholestatic presentation? I think that message should be very clear that the Wilsonian will not come with cholestasis. This That's is my thinking. Least likely cause, sir. Least likely cause. Least likely. I think Wilson would be the least likely. Usually, they can even have normal alkaline phosphatase. What to talk of a clinical cholestasis? They will not come as clinical cholestasis. So, I don't know. I was a little surprised. You know, 50% of the audience choosing... Wilson has the possibility where somebody is coming with recurrent cholestasis. So that should not be. Yeah. That's why I was mentioning people are attracted by Wilson. <laughs> Wilson, okay. Okay, Aman, go ahead. How do you analyze? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, on the basis of history, uh, uh, our possibility is a recurrent intrahepatic cholestatic cholestasis. The uh, first possibility we have kept is primary sclerosing cholangitis with or without overlap. The second is the viral hepatitis. Third is benign recurrent intrahepatic cholestasis. And maybe the least likely possibility of progressive family intrahepatic cholestasis. So, can you quickly tell us the points in favor and against each possibility? Quickly, yeah. Uh, sir, again, quickly, uh, I would like to say that patient, young male, and having a cholestatic jaundice. So, the uh, the possibility of primary sclerosing cholangitis uh, becomes uh, the first possibility. However, there is a, a less likely of resolution of uh, this uh, high jaundice, which spontaneously is also. This is a slightly odd point against this thing. So coming to the viral hepatitis, uh, again, recurrent episodes can happen uh, with... Uh, Don't you have a PSC patient presenting with jaundice and then resolu I mean, resolving and then coming with another episode? Is spontaneous resolution a definite point against? Uh, so relative uh, points are... Uh, can because, uh, it can happen, yeah. Dr. Setu Babu? Yes, it can happen. Yeah, yeah. It will be a rarer presentation. We yeah, expect yeah, a progressive yeah. disease with bilirubin not disappearing, actually. Yes, yes. Okay. And viral hepatitis? Uh, viral hepatitis, sir, again, uh, there is a possibility of viral hepatitis. As such, a patient can present with uh, viral hepatitis. However, the odd point, uh, again, this patient was that uh, patient had cholestasis at the onset of... Uh, so, know, when do you have cholestasis in acute viral hepatitis? If you're saying it was the odd point at the onset. Uh, usually, sir, it, it, it usually follows uh, the onset of jaundice about uh, two to three weeks and then patient usually have a pruritus in uh, eight This is something known as, you know, prolonged cholestasis and acute viral hepatitis. When the disease is getting prolonged and then enzymes are also settling down and everything and patient starts having, you know, cholestatic symptoms. That happens maybe later in the course of the disease rather than, you know, to begin with. Okay. Third possibility? Hmm. Uh, sir, again, a uh, young patient, uh, cholestatic jaundice, and uh, there is a documented complete resolution of uh, his cholestatic symptoms. And uh, the odd point was it's a relatively less common disease. So this is a relative point. So 
still we would like to uh, rule out these three possibilities after no the people are asking about you know again viral hepatitis a which can have cholestasis so could it be just two distinct episodes of viral hepatitis a yes sir that's why uh, we have kept the possibility of viral okay. hepatitis okay okay you had kept that possibility fine dr setu babu please uh, could it be e going into chronicity oh yeah chronic hiv so that's the question yes yes the first episode is typical e and second thing is i am little disturbed you said always overlap syndrome could you be more specific which overlap is overlapping the syndrome uh, sir psc ah overlap syndrome uh, yeah you please say this which one is you know psc pbc psc ah ah PSC, pbc PSC. all these combinations are of a histopathological serological you know presentations false positivity you should be very careful again in this area when you mention one entity what is the nearest serology nearest histology when it comes to overlap everything overlaps and then your approach to treatment would not make much an approach to the diagnosis i think there you need to be careful majority of them have steroid as still their drug for example you you might say mrcp which i know yeah, it will be discussed no, sorry okay so what did you say about the break uh Yes, sir. I said that the patient, the young male uh, in second okay. decade of life, having cholestatic jaundice with complete resolution of symptoms, and again coming uh, coming to us with the same cholestatic jaundice uh, uh, with intense. So, what is odd for break here? Anything odd for break? Uh, sir, I only felt that uh, it's a relatively a rare entity, and uh, uh, so even though it, there is nothing, no solid point to rule it out completely. so i have kept it third possibility just on the basis of statistics and uh, relative uh, okay dr setu babu yeah could this be a dubin johnson syndrome uh you didn't think of it yeah you didn't think of it so can dubin johnson syndrome i mean uh, they they have uh, can they come with cholestasis number one first question and the second is can they have normalization of bilirubin in between this is the two question but the question is good one can you have cholestasis and dubin johnson first question yes sir cholestasis uh, can be seen but there is a as we discussed earlier also the normalization of bilirubin to uh, complete normalization of lft and bilirubin is not uh, really seen uh, in dubin johnson syndrome so in this patient there was a complete resolution and there was no uh, real precipitating thing and patient having severe uh, dense to right is so slightly odd against okay i think uh, we can my we last can... question yeah. just to just to trouble you could this be a g6pd deficiency cholestasis being there of course Uh, sir, i just want to extend your knowledge not really you need to know these questions can you know come in differential diagnosis can be excluded very fast but not to think of them not to know of them is not expected so g6pd again is a very important entity for us hemolysis see, being a dominant see the dubin johnson can obviously always comes with conjugated hyperbilirubinemia but they usually yes. do not have cholestatic features that is number yes. one so the fluctuations are well known in dubin johnson they may not touch normal but fluctuations are well known number one this other question in the chat box is about pfic3 which you thought initially could it be pfic3 so for the sake of audience pfic3 is the progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis type 3 we have pfic1 and 2 versus pfic3 aman can you tell us could it be pfic3 which occurs in adults whereas type 1 and 2 which we said occur in children Uh, sir, P fig three. We had uh, thought of the uh, possibility of P fig three. However, P fig three is again a progressive disease, and once uh, there uh, there is a cholestasis, so resolution of cholestasis is uh, unlikely. And also, it is associated with other uh, associated features like uh, growth retardation, mental abnormality, and extra hepatic features also. So, okay, uh, yeah, sure. I think, and maybe we will when we go to the investigations, it will probably help you in differentiating. How does investigation help us in differentiating? We will discuss that out. Okay. Next, what, what do you want? Let's go to the examination now. These were all on history. So, anything positive on examination because the time is short. Uh, sir, only thing was that patient had ictus and there was uh, excoriation marks on his. Uh, so okay, there was excoriation marks, scratch marks, and 
John, this that's it. Okay, let's go further. Anything positive on systemic examination? Uh, sir, abdomen was soft. Liver was uh, thirteen to fourteen. Liver span was thirteen to fourteen centimeter. No free fluid, no spleen, and the rest of the systemic examination was also no. So okay, the question again here is before. Uh, what are your possibilities? And in addition to this, people are now asking: Could it be? Uh, you have kept your syndromic possibility as intrahepatic cholestasis, right? So, could it be extrahepatic cholestasis also? So, that is the first question. And why are you keeping intrahepatic as the only possibility? I can see it on the screen, not extrahepatic. And within intrahepatic, you have enumerated various possibilities. First, tell us why not extrahepatic. Uh, sir, this uh, uh, patient had a uh, cholestatic uh, uh, hepatitis. The first episode, which was progressive and it resolved, so it's painless, progressive and resolved it of its own without any intervention. And then uh, subsequently, there is no any history of uh, pain abdomen, no history of any surgical intervention, no history of any gastric outlet obstruction or vomiting or any cholangitis uh, or any past history of any surgical intervention. So. Uh, uh, points out uh, towards intrahepatic etiology of uh, cholestatic jaundice. So we have. Uh, Dr. Setu Babu, Dr. Saraya, please. Dr. Dr. Akash, would you have a difference of opinion with Aman? Akash, you sir, I think extrahepatic uh, would be a possibility. Sir, based on history, uh, I would still keep intrahepatic as the only possibility. Okay, uh, Dr. Saraya, your comments, please. Yes, yes, intrahepatic, I think. And intrahepatic. Okay. So within intrahepatic, Aman, um, uh, what are the possibilities? Any differences now or any addition or subtractions? What you said based on the history versus after examination? Are you changing your order? Can an SOL in the liver present like this? Maybe a benign one, like a large cyst? <laughs> We know hydrated cyst or uh, intrahepatic cyst. Uh, we have actually a patient, maybe I'll send the x-ray to you. Large cyst causing you know, partial biliary obstruction, pressing on the duct, intrahepatic ducts. It just to expand. Once again, I repeat, it's only to expand our uh, again, you know, sir, thinking. Uh, recurrent polystatic uh, jaundice in this patient and then resolution, the interval between two episodes of span of one year. And... Uh, in between symptom free period and no prodromal symptom as such. So I think the presence of uh, any extra hepatic possible, uh, was less likely in this patient uh, on the basis of the and exam. One more learning point. If only this patient had had severe pain abdomen or an your entire differential diagnosis jumps to new area altogether. Be careful about that. Fortunately, you did not have pain here. Yeah. Even a moderate pain would actually mirror another group of diagnosis altogether. From cholestasis, you move to severe cholangitis, not amounting to PSC-like syndrome. Maybe a stone, maybe a large cyst. Sometimes, you know, lymph nodes rupturing into the CBD and a hemobilia. These are some of the possibilities you need to think when pain is added. Keep a note on that. Absolutely. I, I think I agree. So uh, can we move further? Uh, so the question to you would be, I think Akash, maybe you can chip in now. How will you investigate? I mean, he has a possibility of PSC. It could be recurrent viral hepatitis, which is happening. Brick is also a possibility. I don't think we should be considering PFIC because this is really not a progressive disease. Even the present episode is also settling down, right? The first had completely settled down. The second is also settling down. I would agree with the first three possibilities, but may not with the fourth. So with this in mind, you know, how will you investigate and reach a, uh, you know, uh, diagnosis? Sir, I would like to see uh, the complete blood count and LFTs and coagulogram of uh, this patient. Okay, we'll show you that. Uh, yeah, so can you read and give your inference from here? So you have the first episode which was happened in, you know, 2019 went up to, you know, March uh, 2020, which was almost four months. And then the second episode, you know, started somewhere in December and was ongoing till January, December when he came to us, but it was improving. So just infer this. Yes, sir. So, uh, sir, uh, in all the investigations, we can see the complete blood count is almost normal with normal platelets. And in the LFTs, uh, the patient had predominantly uh, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia with one report of March 2020 showing normal enzymes. 
uh, normal bilirubin and normal enzymes uh, in the uh, liver enzymes sir uh, there has been uh, uh, high uh, uh, alphos alkaline phosphate has always been high and we have uh, two reports of uh, uh, ggt also which is uh, fairly normal sir and with synthetic functions are preserved in this patient so we so, have conjugated hyperbilirubinemia with high alphos and normal ggt in this patient sir so are you aware of an entity called you know uh, normal gamma gt or low gamma gt cholestasis if yes what are the causes of a normal gamma hey, gt or low gamma gt cholestasis what ko hai yes sir we can have uh, uh, normal uh, we have a poll question on this sir okay we have a poll question okay okay fine so uh, let's move further so based on this uh, uh, aman should we ask the uh, sorry akash to tell his possibilities or we go to the poll question first we have a poll question here sir so we go to the poll question okay fine so which of the following diseases are associated with jaundice and normal gamma gt except so all except hoga na theek hai so pfic1 brick pfic2 and pfic3 was it sunil who prepared the question yeah sunil has prepared <laughs> yeah i think if you are not very careful let me aman and uh, akash if you are not very careful these are all negative question yes except <laughs> all but so you should be careful people like me tendency to answer is the nearest one whichever is attractive so be very very specific and careful very dangerous examiner taneja so all always normal gtt except can you accept well, okay uh, maybe we can have the answer what what the audience is answering let's look at that first pfic 367% okay. pfic 29% brick 17% pfic 7% i expected brick to get much more scoring actually so this is actually normal except which means all would be normal gamma gt Hello. there is only one which will have elevated G- gdp correct, here correct, correct. and the answer should be pfic 3 so, any any to akash your thoughts on this yes sir uh, i absolutely agree that pfic 3 uh, is not associated with uh, normal gdt and rest all can have normal gdt so the answer should have been pfic 3 yes we agree okay fine so can we move further here sir just a quick summary of cholestasis sure. and uh, these are the causes extra hepatic causes of raised uh, ggt and in intra hepatic also you can have high ggt in mitochondrial disorders or beta oxidation as well as disorders of the canalic root system uh, low ggt is classically associated with pfic and brick and elevated ggt is seen in pfic 3 sir neil i thought of asking you you particularly one question pardon me yes, such sir. high bilirubin do you attribute it to only one cause or some add on cause i mean you are very uncomfortable 60 <laughs> um brick is known colis- yes yes a brick is known to cause very high bilirubin and severe cholestasis and sometimes you know the treatment becomes very difficult and in fact people have undergone transplant for brick because of such incapacitating symptoms so i think sir this remains a very strong possibility in this patient and you base this on liver biopsy as you are uh, you know real yes sir Okay, so uh, Akash, how will you further? I uh, mean, Aman, maybe you can take it up. How will you further investigate and reach a conclusion? Because looks like this could be, you know, one of the possibilities with cholestasis intrahepatic with normal gamma GT. So normal gamma GT, we said, you know, the brick can be brick one and brick two also. Yes. Sir. And yes. pfic is also pfic one, pfic two. So since we are considering, are you considering pfic one, pfic two here? a brick one and brick two here sir uh, sir i am considering uh, only brick here because pfic 1 and 2 are usually seen in the younger age and uh, pfic 3 is uh, already out on the basis of normal ggt so right. i would like to keep brick 1 and 2 both is my so both brick 1 and 2 okay how will you further investigate uh, sir ju- just because of the uh, predominantly cholestatic symptoms i would like to see any cross sectional imaging and also because we had viral Uh, hepatitis with cholestasis as the possibility. So, any viral markers if available, sir. So, the viral markers are all negative, and the autoimmune markers are also ne- negative. Even the extended panel was negative. What next, sir? Any cross-sectional imaging to rule out any uh, overlap in this patient, sir? 
cross sectional okay can you read this mr uh, ultrasound was normal but can you read this mr cp for us so this is the mr cp film showing uh, normal cbd till the lower end with the uh, uh, normal in, uh, intrahepatic radicals which are not dilated and uh, so i think this is the normal uh, the bc extra hepatic bile ducts norm normal but i am not sure about intra hepatic left duct dekho thoda sa is it all right so you cannot see any uh, bleeding structures or okay dr setu babu dr saraya what is what, what is brick versus psc in mrcp what, what uh, just one two three findings here one two three findings brick is almost normal yes sir so what happens in psc what are all mrcp changes that you can get psc is not a uniform disease you can have a focal disease as well so could you give me four variants possible in a psc on mrcp sir we would see a uh, dominant structure in uh, case of a psc we can see pruning of the uh, uh, we can see the uh, pruning of the intrahepatic uh, radicals we can see uh, sir bleeding appearance and uh, so these are the characteristic findings we can find a dominant structure or a non dominant structure also we can have multiple structures as well uh, in the mrcp film and yes. one more just to confuse you there could be a higher percentage of gall stones in these people which also ajay you should comment on yeah that. yeah i, I think uh, that was a question also and somebody had commented that's very important are there any differences per se related to gall stones between brick 1 and brick 2 any idea on this i think gall stones would be more common in big two this big is what i understanding is and this entity known as npac also low phosphorylated associated cholelithiasis which again happens in you know younger people gall stone associated yeah, and that is associated cholestasis that is also more common with big two that is the other one and then there is another entity you know what is known as uh, in pfic3 what you can have is you know the mdr3 deficiency gene which is also associated with gall stones so pfic3 and brick2 are more commonly associated with gall stones in comparison to brick1 right okay so i think uh, to me i think this mrcp looks okay except for okay. this left duct which was not very clear so what will you do dr so, raya your comments on this i, mean, I, I agree in fact there are, there are few changes we can see right, right, right. left duct and this can be a small duct psc yeah okay So, uh, can yeah. I point out here? Yes, As please. Akash said there's no there's no bleeding appearance, so that's why I rule out PSC. Right. Uh, important that every disease will have a spectrum, where where this uh, uh, narrowing and and bleeding appearance is end stage disease, which is most classical. You won't be wrong if you observe and you say PSC, but every patient in PSC in evolution will not have bleeding appearance. so not only to look at end spectrum clinical features or end spectrum imaging features it good to look at the whole spectrum as dr uh, dr setu babu also said that uh, look at the whole spectrum uh, rather than only end spectrum at end spectrum you are more right you are more specific but this you will be less sensitive absolutely yeah right. and and as rightly been pointed out you can still have psc and the your larger ducts or your cholangiogram may be normal and and that's the entity what we call it as small duct psc yeah absolutely okay so what will you do now further sir with the uh, so we can see some uh, defect in the left hepatic duct so i would like to uh, go ahead with the uh, liver biopsy sir in this patient uh, okay so can we take the poll question before that okay we'll take the poll question first okay so what are the characteristic biopsy findings in brick Periportal fibrosis, intracranicular cholestasis, Austin stain positivity, and neutrophilic infiltrates. Let's see. Uh, there are uh, some difference. Uh, I think this is two questions. Yogita, you have you have shown question mm. two. Case question two. two. I can see question three on my screen. Question two. Question two. Sorry. Yeah, I think. Uh, the, uh, which one you want to show? Sorry. Which one you want to show? Previous one. The previous one. Okay, so can you go back to the previous question? Uh, Yogita, can you have to change? Ah, yes. yes. Yeah, this is the one. Okay. 
it's still not moving still on my screen but maybe any one of you can read it yeah, yeah. i think there i think it's still readings are coming yeah uh, i think the, the answering now i think people have slowed their pace now from 77% we moved to only 54% answering okay okay we stop now and say the result yes so the periportal fibrosis is 13% intracanalicular cholestasis is 68% arsen positivity 15% neutrophilic infiltrate 4% i think intracanalicular cholestasis is the predominant finding maybe dr sunil you can or any uh, aman or akash you can first comment and maybe then dr sunil can tell us the right answer the intracanalicular cholestasis we would find uh, as the predominant finding in brick sir yes i agree sir okay fine so can we move on the hepatocytes are very healthy that's what it, yeah 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 infilt we Normal always factor. talk about infiltration which is probably not significant sir this is the hnd stain uh, in low power field showing sir characteristic intracanalicular cholestasis with the uh, normal hepatocytes sir so we can see the portal tract with the uh, uh, no uh, any inflammatory infiltrate which is not seen sir and normal hepatocytes normal uh, architecture with intracanalicular cholestasis sir see the, the differential you know uh, akash was about the psc versus brec right so i would be more interested if you tell me any bile duct changes if you if at all you can see here or any particular special stain you would like to do for bile ducts you know because you know we need to look at the bile duct injury here bile duct proliferation bile duct injury right so and and what we call the typical changes of you know pericholangitis and and what happens in psc so are, are you commenting on that report sir in the small duct uh, psc we would find uh, sir uh, onion skin appearance in the uh, bile duct onion skin findings as we cannot see any such finding and uh, we will also find some amount of fibrosis uh, which is again not seen here okay so i think the biopsy looked largely normal except for cholestasis right so i think there were no bile duct changes if i can recall dr sunil you have any idea there were any bile duct changes no sir sir it was normal yeah. it was normal so there were no bile duct changes right okay so let's go further so uh, we have the poll question or yes sir, sir babu yes sir a poll question so now between hmm. is brick which is diagnosed as benign is it truly benign yes sir usually uh, these patients this is a benign disease sir and these patients do not uh, usually progress to a uh, chronic liver disease now i want you to look at uh, current literature where there are multiple case reports where brick has progressed to severe liver disease just go back and look at it i won't. Right. it's not all that benign that we thought i was also surprised when i read year back a uh, few case reports i think you should go to the journal of hepatology and recheck today itself is brick all that benign which yeah even i was thinking it's a benign and is not the whole truth okay go to that's the okay. i think before we go to the poll question there are two three questions in the chat box first is about the role of cytokeratin staining which i was saying special staining for bile ducts uh, in the liver biopsy so what your comment on that second is people are talking about the threshold or when would you do a biopsy in this kind of situation uh, uh first episode or second episode like this and third is about the genetic testing or screening you know with uh, this kind of biopsy So special staining for bile ducts uh, definitely if you are considering a possibility of overlap uh, we should do that and uh, so what site of keratin stain do you do for bile ducts so it's usually the ck7 right ck7 staining we do and that stains the bile ducts so you can say about whether they are absent or what i think ck7 and the genetic testing the mutational studies which are there you know so that's what yes so i i i just wanted to introduce one more uh, which we were look is a vanishing bile duct syndrome 
you need to know when you know these are all overlaps you know when we talk really some of these people actually we saw during covid period some of them get a liver injury which is similar to vanishing bile duct syndrome aman akash you need to go back and again look at this entity and you may have a question on this so sure. so let's go to the poll question all of the following statements are true for break except at least two episodes of jaundice separated by a symptom free interval intense pruritus elevated lft with normal gamma gt and progression to chronic liver disease so all are to accept ajay we need to close this since we will close i think this would be the, the last last uh, this is the last poll question and maybe dr sunil would like to summarize maybe approach to uh, you know recurrent jaundice and few slides and then we'll close here oh that's would be fine here so uh, are people polling for this voting for yeah. this progression to chronic liver disease 83% elevated lft with normal ggt 7% intense pruritus 6% two episodes of jaundice with symptom difference of short difference is 3% so most okay. of the people would feel that it doesn't progress to chronic liver disease but at as pointed by professor setu babu that there are case reports where it has you know worsened even the prick people so i think but in general i think the perception is that this is benign and doesn't really progress on to chronic liver disease fine so maybe maybe i think the treatment is usually you know uh, is limited to acidoxycholic acid or maybe plasma exchange where you know if they have very high values or other anti pruritic you know drugs or Uh, the bile diversion, or even people have done NBD and various other modalities. Let's not go into the details on that. And even lastly, as Dr. Smee pointed out, people have even been transplanted because of the you know of this condition. So we can stop it here, and maybe I'll request Dr. Sunil Taneja to uh, give us maybe a approach to recurrent jaundice in few slides, or maybe before that, Dr. Setu Babu and Dr. Saraya, if they I want to. I think now we'll we ask Sunil to go ahead. We okay. did enough of this. Uh, Ajay, can you this is for everybody to really understand? So right. the final diagnosis is break in this patient. Yes, final is break because of the two three. But he has two distinct episodes. This is the criteria which is required. Number one, with a it free interval was free of jaundice. That is one. Secondly, it was a pruritus which was there, so cholestatic jaundice, high alkaline phosphatase, normal gamma GT, and histology so normal. Case and histology normal. so that makes the case for break here whether it was break 1 or break 2 i think as i said short of gene mutations it will not be possible for us yes, to tell sir. that but since uh, the absence of gall stones and various other things the and the break 1 being more common i think we'll put more money on break 1 here and how was he treated uh, over time he was treated with acidoxycholic acid luckily he didn't require any plasma exchange or bile diversion treatment and his second episode has also settled let me also give a message here that each episode of cholestasis can last for few weeks to even months in break and the interval between different episodes can be again months to even years people can have a second episode 5 years 10 years later so that interval can be variable and the each episode duration can be variable but you must have two distinct episode but then the question which we always discuss in that side is how about a patient where the biopsy and everything is fitting into that and he is presented for the first time for example if this patient had come for the first time to us his mrcp would have been normal his alk force was elevated gamma gt was normal his biopsy would have been normal so he would still be break even if, even if there was a no second episode so the second episode you can say only when the second episode happens and that may may not happen for many many years so that would be the message we would like to give So Dr. Sunil, you can go ahead, please, with the uh, your approach. Yeah. Yes, so I'm going to skip this last question and uh, just to give you an overview, we've had a lengthy discussion on an approach to recurrent jaundice. So let's start with approach to a patient with jaundice. I, ju I have just tried to simplify this. It can be either because of increased production of bilirubin or decreased clearance, and in decreased clearance, the causes can be related to the liver or to the extrahepatic biliary system. and increased production is primarily because of hemolysis which can be either intravascular or an extravascular hemolysis so this is the causes a list of causes of hemolysis you can have non immune causes causes and hereditary are common in which g6pd is the commonest 
and you can have acquired causes like liver disease and hyperspinism. And then you also have immune causes of hemolysis in which you have uh, immune hemolytic anemias and PNH as common cause. Uh, so coming to the second one, decreased clearance in which you can have either defects in transport and conjugation. And in this you have Gilbert syndrome or krigler nager syndrome too, which can present in adulthood. In intrahepatic causes, either it can be a hepatitic illness in which the common cause is viral hepatitis, AIH, alcohol induced, uh, alcoholic uh, hepatitis or alcoholic ACLF. And then you have drugs and toxins and as well as uh, cirrhosis can have a hepatitis and worsening uh, like ACLF like presentation. The second form is the cholestatic pattern in which uh, a cholestatic form of viral hepatitis can be there, uh, drug induced, then PBC and PSC and certain infiltrative disorders uh, IgG4 hepatopathy is an upcoming cause and it's been diagnosed more and more. And as we discussed, genetic and familial causes like Brick, PFIC and Dubin-Johnson and Rotor syndrome can also present with cholestasis. So moving on to the extrahepatic causes, uh, primarily it is uh, benign and cholelithiasis is one of the common cause. Then you can have biliary strictures, which can be related to chronic pancreatitis or uh, surgeries. And then PSC, sc uh, secondary sclerosing cholangitis, ischemic cholangio, Pethys, IgG4, cholangiopathy, and AIDS cholangiopathy are other common, uncommon causes. Uh, you have to keep in mind that malignancy is an important cause of extrahepatic uh, cause of cholestasis. So how do you determine the pattern of liver injury? You can calculate the R value, which can be determined by uh, a ratio of ALT uh, upon the upper uh, limit of normal to ALT uh, divided by ALP uh, uh, divided by the upper limit of normal. And Hepatocellular injury is if R is more than five and ALT is more than two. Uh, cholestatic injury is R is between uh, less than two and ALP is more than two and in mixed is if it is between the two. So moving on to how do you differentiate between intrahepatic and extrahepatic cholestasis? So in intrahepatic cholestasis, there will be history or presence of signs of hepatocellular failure like GI bleed, ascites, and cephalopathy. There can be a temporal history of use of drugs which are known to cause cholestatic liver injury, like drugs like augmentin. And uh, there will be history of prodrome if you have viral hepatitis with cholestatic phase. And as we have discussed, there can be a personal or family history of uh, autoimmune diseases. And uh, if the patient has been on TPN for a long time, they can have intrahepatic cholestasis. And if there is a history of bi liver biopsy in such patients, then you should consider that the cause likely would be intrahepatic. And extrahepatic, if there is a prior history of surgery, hepatobiliary surgery, if there's history of gallstone disease, and if there are features of cholangitis, cholangitis forms a very important component of extrahepatic cause of cholestasis. And if there is fever, uh, pain in the right hypochondrium, and along with that jaundice, then you should consider that it's a extrahepatic cause of cholestasis. And if there is a history of endoscopic or radiological bilirubin drainage, obviously you will think of extrahepatic causes, and then imaging would always help you in differentiating intrahepatic form and extrahepatic cause of cholestasis. And then in extrahepatic, again, you would like to differentiate between benign and malignant causes. Benign, obviously the history would be long and there would be history of sometimes recurrent bidri cole if there's gallstones. And if there is any history of surgery in the past, that might also suggest that there's a benign stricture there. And then obviously imaging can help you to differentiate between benign and malignant causes. If you consider malignant as a cause of extrahepatic cholestasis, uh, then uh, most of these patients would have constitutional, severe constitutional symptoms. Advanced age would also favor malignant disease. If there is very deep jaundice, then obviously you should think of malignancy first. Uh, presence of palpable mass and some relative points like GIB, gastric outlet obstruction, and ascites would also point toward malignant causes of extrahepatic biliary obstruction. So just to show you this final slide of approach to a recurrent jaundice patient, we have discussed that unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia can be an important cause, and you have to look for evidence of hemolysis in such patients. This can be done by looking at the hemoglobin, LDH, retic count. You can look at the peripheral smear and the plasma, urine, HP, as well as the haptoglobulin or the DCT test. And if there is evidence of a hemolysis, then you can label that this unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia is because of hemolysis. And the common causes for this are vitamin B12 deficiency, autoimmune hemolytic anemias, Drugs which can precipitate G6PD uh, it can be uh, G6PD deficiency, which can be precipitated by drugs. Wilson disease and sickle cell crisis can also lead to hemolysis. The other entity which we have already discussed is uh, 
Gilbert syndrome. And as uh, Aman and Akasha pointed out, that <laughs> unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia can worsen yeah. the stress and fasting state. And you can do a genetic testing to confirm the presence of Gilbert syndrome. The second part is yeah, if you have conjugated hyperbilirubinemia with increased enzymes, liver enzymes, uh, predominantly AST and T, and this would fit into an hepatitic like illness. The common causes we have discussed include AIH, Hep B flare, alcoholic steatohepatitis, and sometimes pregnancy related diseases like hyperemesis, gravidarum, and ICP can also present like this. And the last is conjugated hyperbilirubinemia with raised alkaline phosphatase. And in this, we have discussed that PSC and overlap syndrome should be considered. But sometimes uh, you can also have extra hepatic causes like cholidocolithiasis, uh, periampullary carcinoma, relapsing pancreatitis, autoimmune pancreatitis, and IgG4 disease, which can present with uh, recurrent jaundice. Uh, lastly, we have discussed that normal AST ALT with conjugated hyperbilirubinemia with gamma GT is how you make a diagnosis of BRIC along with the histology. So I think I can uh, stop here. So thank you, Dr. Sunil. I think we can hand over the stage now to Dr. Gavin. But this last comment, which was there about the some precipitating factors for BRIC, including some antibiotics, including amoxiclav combinations, which can be done. So that point is well taken. So uh, Dr. Gavin, uh, maybe you can go ahead. Uh, I think we can stop here. This is lunch time. It's 1.30. Uh, before we close, uh, uh, I'd like to thank uh, both Akas and Amandeep for a wonderful case presentation. Two beautiful patients, uh, two quite uh, a quite different spectrum of uh, a patient who come with recurrent jaundice. That's remarkable. And both of you did extremely well, very thoughtful and uh, very lucid. Uh, thank you very much and many congratulations to both of you doing so well. Uh, coming to uh, Dr. Saraya, Dr. Sethu Babu, and Dr. Ajay Duseja, wonderful discussion. I think uh, I learned a lot of points, I'm sure, our fellow colleagues uh, uh, who participated in this, uh, in this uh, case discussion must have learned a lot of uh, important points. How do we approach a right, right way to approaching the current jaundice? Uh, thank you so very much for uh, taking us through these two cases, quite learning experience. Dr. Sunil, you have been remarkable. Your summary slides of uh, approach is very useful. And I request that if you can send this slide to Yogita and she can participate with all the participants, that will be a kind of ready to corner uh, on their phone that how do you approach uh, uh, recurrent jaundice. Uh, thank you all uh, so very much for participating. And more importantly, this was a very lively, dis lively discussion. There were at least more than 150 questions uh, by true. all our participants, uh, meaning thereby, and I can infer from that, that all our parts, many of our participants were actively involved in case discussion and sending very, very important questions. Uh, and uh, Ajay, you just took almost every question uh, into discussion. So, so that was uh, very wonderful of all the participants uh, in joining actively in the case discussion. Uh, we need to close this today's session, but before we close, uh, we need to invite you for yet another session next week on uh, next Sunday, and the topic will be uh, cirrhosis with SCC, and how do you approach and how do you uh, make diagnosis, stage, and all other issues related with clinical medicine. Thank, uh, you. thank you, Yogita. Thank you, Dineshi and Manish for, for coordinating uh, this program. Uh, Thank you so very much again. Have a good day. See you next week. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Ajay. Thanks Thank for uh, bye tolerating bye. me. Tolerating me. <laughs> no, no. Thank you, sir. So Thank you. You want to stay? The Fritubha, you want to stay? Yeah, okay. I want to just convey you a couple of. Um, and and Fry also, sir. Sunil also. You also stay yeah, back. Yeah, Ajay also. I also stay back. Yeah, yeah. Please. Yeah, you can. You can. <laughs> okay. So I, I, I just uh, had an observation. Um, Maybe uh, people are still logged and you want to have discussion no, once no, no, everybody no. logs on? I, th I think uh, the IT team should remove, I mean, can uh, yeah, let other, others to log off, yeah. Man, you can log off.